isn't it human nature to avoid things that we don't like, right? I mean, this starts right from childhood. It's human nature to avoid things that we just don't like, like vegetables or, or exercise or, or people who maybe only eat vegetables or, or people who exercise all the time or people who dress like they eat vegetables and dress like they exercise all the time, whatever it is. And sometimes avoiding things we don't like won't hurt us. And then sometimes avoiding things we don't like can hurt us. Now, in the category of avoiding things that we don't like that won't hurt us, who's a fan of horror movies or or scary movies? Okay, I'll be honest, not me. Or at least it took me a long time to come to grips with it. You see, when I was a, a young kid, my parents thought it was brilliant to show tiny little John the first Terminator movie. And you might be saying, look, that's not a scary movie, John. Come on. But let me tell you, it scared the you-know-what out of me. <laughs> the visuals and the loud sounds and here's this awful looking machine guy. And it was just, it was all too much for me. But what it did actually was, was make me fearful of a lot of those other kinds of movies, in particular horror films. So I spent a good chunk of my life thereafter watching scary movies either on, on mute or on such a low volume that I have no idea what was going on. You know, I have to rewatch it again a little louder until maybe the third or fourth time I'd, I'd know finally what was going on. Now, again, there's, there's lots of things that, look, if you don't like them, you can avoid them and it won't hurt you like Arnold Schwarzenegger. But there are some things that you don't like that if you avoid them, they have the potential to hurt you. Now, this might have you a little shook, but look, please don't judge me harshly. There are statements in the Bible that I don't particularly like. There really are. And today, I, I got to talk about one of them. And the reason I need to talk about one is this particular statement answers a very, very important question. And it's a question that I think is so profoundly relevant to all of us. However, there's an issue. You see, there's an issue here. I don't like the answer. And if you don't like the answer to this question either, just remember that this is not my answer. This is not me speaking. This is somebody else. So please, please, please don't shoot the messenger. The question that our author answers is something we've been talking about through this whole series. In a time such as this, what do you do when there's nothing that you can do, right? What do you do when there's nothing you can do? When it is what it is, and that's just the way that it's going to be. When we are in a bad circumstance, in difficult seasons, we can feel jealous, we can feel resentful, you you can compare yourself to others. You know, everybody else seems to have the family that you were supposed to have. Everybody else seems to have the relationship, the, the job, the health, the opportunity that you were supposed to have. And you can be tempted to run, abandon, to quit, to give up, or to give in. And then you see along comes James, James, who's the brother of Jesus. And he gives us advice that's really, it's kind of insensitive. And the reason it strikes me as being insensitive is James doesn't know what's going on in my life. And James doesn't know what's going on in your life. And that very James is going to give us advice and tell us what to do without hearing our stories. And that's, that's always a bad idea. It's a bit like when you read in the New Testament where, where Jesus says, look, don't worry about tomorrow. And, you know, you kind of want to raise your hand and say, hey, slow down. Let me tell you about what's coming up tomorrow in my life. And then you can tell me, don't worry about tomorrow. It just seems so insensitive to just give these big statements like, don't worry about tomorrow. But here's the thing. What James is about to tell us falls into that same category. But regardless of how much I don't like what James says, and maybe regardless of how much maybe you don't like what James says, we would be remiss not to take his instruction seriously. And here's why. Because this is James, the brother of Jesus. And more specifically, this is James who was the leader in the church in Jerusalem during the first century. This is James who believed that his brother was his Lord because he saw his brother crucified and then he saw his brother after he rose from the dead. Amazing. For 30 years, James, and this is what gives him the credibility here. James was surrounded by, and he was actually responsible. He was a leader for a community in crisis. Things were not going well for those early Jesus followers. But here's what he told his first century Jesus follower friends to do. 
And here's what he tells you to do. And I think this is what he's telling me to do too. James chapter one, here's what he says. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, this is amazing that all these years later, James considered his brother, his Lord. Now what he says next, if you grew up in church, it's pretty familiar. And here's the part that, let me just say, it's not my favorite part of the Bible. Here's what he says. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials, whenever you face trials, not if ever, whenever. You can't pray them away. You can't obey them away. You can't faith them away. Trials are going to happen. Whenever you wake up one day and, oh no, you get that call. Your son or, or, or daughter calls or perhaps the doctor calls. You're surprised by a trial. He, he says this, he says, whenever you face trials of many kinds. And here's what we're to do. And again, remember, this isn't me talking this is James. He says, whenever you're faced with many kinds of trials, right, consider it, consider it. What he means by that is adjust your perspective. Adjust your thinking. I want you to rethink it, James says. I, I want you to reframe your trial as pure joy, my brothers and sisters. Reframe or, or rethink your trial in such a way that you can begin to see it as a, this isn't me talking again, as a source of joy. And how can he say this without knowing the circumstance of our lives? He hasn't even heard our story. And he, and he says this, no matter what you're going through, no matter what your trial is, I want you to step back and I want you to reframe it to the point where you can find joy in the midst of your trial. Man, how can he say that? You might be asking that. He tells us, he says, because. He says, because you know. He says, there's something you know that you've lost sight of because you're in the midst of a trial. Of course you've lost sight of it. He says, because you know that when you stop to think about it, when you pause long enough to catch your breath, when you're able to see beyond your immediate circumstances, he says, here's what you're going to remember. Here's what you're going to discover. Because you know that the testing of your faith, the testing of of your faith. And this is his point here. This is the point he's trying to make. Trials expose the authenticity of our faith. And the term faith in this particular context actually is referring to our confidence in God. So it can be restated this way. Trials expose the authenticity of our confidence in God. In trials, we discover in those moments what you believe, uh, what you really believe, what you were pretending to believe, what you were taught as as a child, but you never really embraced as an adult is now being tested. And to put it another way, when our circumstances deteriorate, our, our artificial, our counterfeit, our what's in it for me, faith deteriorates right along with it. Maybe you've seen this happen to other people. It, Maybe this is your story. And James is telling us, look, whether we like it or not, James says there is joy in discovering how real our faith really is. There is joy in discovering that even though I wouldn't sign up for what's happening in the midst of my trial, I'm discovering something about myself that I could not discover any other way. In the midst of trials, we are confronted with the authenticity or the lack of authenticity of our faith. And James says, there is joy in making that discovery. And this perspective of faith stands in, in stark contrast to some of the, the silly things that can often be taught when it comes to faith. You see, faith is not how we get God to do stuff for us. <laughs> that's, that's not the point of faith. You see, faith is is not a superpower. Faith is simply confidence that God already did something. Faith is simply confidence that God, who is God, reveals himself to be in the New Testament and that he will do everything that he's promised. That faith is ultimately a response to God. It's not a way to leverage God or get God to do something he wasn't originally intending to do. That's not faith. That's not New Testament faith. So James says, here's what happens. When you're facing a trial 
And you can't avoid trials of life, right? When you face trials, immediately you discover something about you. You discover something about your faith. And ultimately, you discover something about your heavenly father. And James says, look, if you'll just, if you'll just stay, step back for a moment, if you'll catch your breath, if you'll regain your perspective, there is joy in that discovery. So here's what he says. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces. And he says, whenever, not if ever, right? You face trials of many kinds. Consider that whole process, that whole encounter as joyful or pure joy, my brothers and sisters, because, and here's the thing, it also produces something. And here's what it produces. He says, over time, the trials that you're facing will produce perseverance. And you know what that is, don't you? It's that ability to hold up. It's the ability to hold up under pressure or under stress. In other words, he says that trials, look, even though we don't sign up for them, the trials make our faith stronger. And trials make our faith stronger because trials automatically exercise our faith. But here's some good news in the midst of this. This is not an exercise that, that you choose. This is an exercise that, that chooses you. I don't choose it. You don't choose it. It chooses us. And then Jam, James says the most, one of the most interesting things. He says, don't leave the gym early. Well, that, that's not exactly what he says, but that's kind of what he means. He, look what he wrote next. He says this, let perseverance finish its work. In other words, look, don't bail out in the middle of the process. And, and I get that this is a really big, it's a big, uncomfortable idea. He's saying, look, what God is doing right now through this trial is at the center of what God is doing in your life. And you don't want to shortchange that process or you will miss out. My friends, the upheaval in our lives is at the epicenter of God's activity in our lives. The upheaval, the, the tension in our lives is the epicenter of God's activity in our lives. So James says this, he says, look, look, don't shortchange the process. Don't, don't bail out on the process. Don't, don't quit the process and don't stop believing because there is an outcome. And here's the outcome. He continues, he says, he says this, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And James, he's kind of using a little play on words here. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, let perseverance complete its work so that you will be complete. Let perseverance, let the process play out. Let perseverance complete its work so that you will be complete. So that you will have a grown up faith. And let's face it, the only way to have a grown up faith is to, is to face a trial and to experience God's faithfulness, the faithfulness of God in the midst of your trial. So ask God to use this until God chooses to remove this. Ask God to use this until life chooses to remove this. Now, here's the thing. James knows how challenging this is, and he knows that for many of us and for many of the folks in his original audience, trying to imagine how, how something good could come from something so bad, how something good could come from some some a trial that is so unimaginable. James says, look, I understand that. So if you can't imagine how to find joy in your trial, if you can't see the value of the fact of that, James says, look, I get it. So here's what I want you to do. If any of you lacks wisdom, if any of you lacks the perspective to see that God is doing something in you and through you, he says, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. Now, here's the problem with all of this. When you're going through a tough time, when I'm going through a tough time, you don't want wisdom. You want relief. But James says, look, I understand that. I get that. But if you want God to choose what, what you're going through and you're having a hard time seeing that there's anything good that could come from this, 
He says, lean in, lean in and ask God for wisdom. This is a prayer that God will always answer. That you say this, just say this, God, give me your eyes to see the way that you see it. Give me your eyes to see me and my friends and my family and my work situation and my finances the way that you see it. Give me wisdom to see as you see. Oftentimes, when we have the ability to see as God sees, we are more inclined to do as God says. James is saying, look, then you will have the perspective you need to persevere through what you're going through. The testing of your faith demonstrates that your faith is real, that God is faithful, and ultimately, you will have stronger faith. And he says, look, don't bail out early. Let perseverance finish its work. Don't leave the gym early so that you may be mature and you may be complete, not lacking in anything. But if you get to the point where you just can't do it any longer, if you get to the point where you're thinking, God, if you're real, God, if you've, you've, you've got to demonstrate your love for me. i got to hear something. i got to know something. I've got to see something that I can't see. He says, in those moments, don't give up. I want you to ask God for wisdom. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, the perspective you need to get through this, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault. And again, it will be given to you. Now, let me ask you this. Have you... Have you ever met someone like this before? Have you ever met someone or known somebody? Maybe you're related to somebody who, who's faced trials of, of many, many kinds. Trials that, you know, they're, they're facing the trial and you're thinking, how would I respond if I were going through that? And you watch them walk through the trial with just extraordinary faith and, and a confidence in God. They face things that you hope you never have to face. But the confidence in God it never wavers. Do you know people like that? You know, in my short life, I've met and I've, I've, I've followed and I look up to some people that are just remarkable. And I think that you would agree. Those are the most inspiring, the most hope-giving, faith-giving people that I've ever met. And I'm more inspired, and really I should say I, I'm most inspired by people whose faith is tested and endures. I'm more inspired by people who, who get a no from God and their faith endures than I am by people who always seem to get a yes from God. And they live kind of this sort of this wrinkle-free life. I mean, isn't it true that, that you're more inspired by people who get a no yet remain faithful? And the reason that you're probably so inspired by them and the reason that I'm so inspired by them is this. They leave us with an amazing confidence that there's a category of faith. There's a brand of faith and there's a category of confidence in God that can endure just about anything. The people whose prayers go unanswered, but their confidence in God remains firm. One of those people that I've looked up, up to in my life is Ravi Zacharias. And, and he's just a, f a phenomenal person, a huge influencer in the 21st century church. Ravi was an apologetics phenom. And, you know, he could just put about any difficult question about life and faith into, into such an easy way to understand. You see, Ravi, he passed away in May after being diagnosed with cancer in March. And he leaves behind his family and, and a world that will greatly miss his influence, his teaching, and his personality, as will I. And I just love Ravi's perspective on faith that he had despite the many trials that he faced in his life, right up to the very end. He said this, I can now enjoy the benefit of time's distant view. The Jesus I know and love today I encountered at the age of 17. But his name and his tug in my life mean infinitely more now than they did when I first surrendered my life to him. I came to him because I did not know which way to turn. I have remained with him because there is no other way I wish to turn. You see, Ravi tried to take his life at the early age of 17 by poisoning himself. 
And while he was in the hospital, a local Christian worker brought him a Bible and told his mother to read to him from John 14, which contains Jesus' words to Thomas the Apostle. And it was one verse. It was verse 19 that changed everything for him. And it reads, Because I live, you also will live. And that was the day that Ravi committed his life to Christ. And when it comes to faith, he says this. He says that God has put enough into the world to make faith in him a most reasonable thing. But he has left enough out to make it impossible to live by sheer reason or observation alone. You see, Ravi battled, and, and despite a grim cancer diagnosis, he remained unwavered in Jesus till the very end. I love this quote from Ravi. When it comes to faith, you can only learn so much from books. You can only learn so much from education. Ultimately, it is the wisdom of God that will carry you through in the toughest situations of life. The way that Ravi lived goes right to the heart of what James was saying all those years ago. He will not give up and run out the clock. I will not give up and run out the clock. Because he lives, I will live. And this was his version of, and to use James's words, I will let perseverance finish its work to my last breath. I'm going to lean in rather than sit it out. And here's the thing. Rabbi's faith did not reverse the consequences of life in a fallen world. The world all prayed for a miracle. And, and you should pray for a miracle. But Ravi's faith did not re reverse the consequences of life in a fallen world. And he didn't expect it to because he understood what faith is. Faith is not a superpower. Faith is not how we get God to do something that God doesn't want to do. Faith is a response to the faithfulness of our Heavenly Father. Instead, Ravi's faith produced perseverance and courage in the midst of a fallen world. My friends, that's why I'm telling a part of his story. It's the people who get a yes from God that we tend to forget so easily. And it's the people who get a no from God, but whose faith is rock solid that change our lives and change the world. And this was James's goal for the first century audiences. And it's his goal for you and it's his goal for me. And this is kind of the bottom line here, that God will use whatever he chooses not to remove. Ravi understood this in his last days. You know, you probably know people who understand that. And James's words, James's instructions are an invitation for all of us to step into this, to say, God, use this until you choose to remove this. Use this until you choose to remove this or life chooses to remove this. But use this to remind me that you are faithful. Use this so that I understand my confidence in you is real. So if we lean in and when we're confused, if we ask for wisdom and if we live with open hands and an open heart, then you will experience and I will experience the amazing faithfulness of God through trials that we did not choose, that chose us, but that God has chosen to use in us. Now here's how James finishes this section of his letter. Listen to what he says, uh, to what he writes. He says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial. And that's Ravi, and, and, and maybe that's going to be you. And, and hopefully, that'll be me. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test and having discovered that their faith is real, that person, listen to what he promises, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. The point is simply this. God values and uses persevering faith. And God has invited you and God has invited me to step into this brand of faith and to begin to see the trials that we're facing every single day in this life because here's what we know with confidence. Persevering faith, it leaves its mark on the world. And it leaves its mark on the people around us. James invites us to lean in and to allow God to purify and strengthen our faith in the midst of what we would never choose. Now here's the thing. 
Right now, we're experiencing some, experiencing some trials in our world. And they're impacting all of us in, in many different ways. But they present all of us with the same opportunity. They present us with the opportunity to let perseverance finish its work so that we may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So with that in mind, I just want to invite you to incorporate the following prayer into your prayer life. And in fact, you may pray every single day and you may want to tack this on, uh, but you may not have prayed in a long time and you're praying maybe for the first time in a long time. Perhaps you've never prayed because you're not sure how. Well, this is a really great time to start. And this prayer is a really great place to start. I want to encourage you to begin praying this with me. Just say this. Heavenly Father, use this until you choose to remove this. Say that with me. Heavenly Father, use this until you choose to remove this. Just to keep it together, together I know you think that you were too far gone But hope is never lost Hope is never lost Hold on, don't let go Just remember that you are a fighter, a fighter You never know just what tomorrow holds And you're stronger than you know You're stronger than you know If you cannot imagine how God could possibly use what you're facing right now, then I want you to do what James tells us to do. 
I want you to ask God for wisdom. Because James says, that is a prayer that God will answer every single time. Would you pray with me? God, we just want to thank you for preserving these extraordinary words. As simplistic as they seem, as insensitive as they can seem. Because really nobody knows what's going on in our lives but but you and us. Give us the wisdom to listen. Give us the, the courage to embrace this. Thank you for showing us that there is a remarkable brand of faith that can sustain us through our most tumultuous and darkest nights. I pray that all of us would experience that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Pastor John, and thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it. We want to encourage you to keep the conversation going. So plan an online meetup with your circle group and post a picture using the hashtag CircleYXC online or connect with a friend this week. We really hope that you enjoyed the morning and we want to thank you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday.